going to talk to you about an idea that I had and then I did some research and then like, some uh, investigations and uh, it was kind of somewhat disappointing but also empowering I guess in that I was partially right. So I want to tell you this story. Um, I've been a sysadmin for over 20 years and before that I was a computer scientist at UNSW only barely but uh, I learned enough during that um, five years of my three year bachelor's degree to get just be dangerous enough with um, theory of computation, which I found really interesting. Um, and so as I've been a sysadmin, there's been, what, 15 years ish of DevOps and configuration code and stuff since, say, Puppet first came out and before that. Uh, you might remember CF Engine and things like that. Um, this uh, Cambrian explosion in the last 15 years, you might call it, of uh, ways of doing configuration as code. Um, and I think this is really fantastic, right? As, as a, an industry, we've been able to be, become very productive and, uh, and uh, solve a lot of problems. Um, but there's a cost because these configurations lay abstractions on top of abstractions like uh, geological layers. Uh, you suddenly realize that you can affect a lot of change with fewer characters in a, say, a git commit. You make a small amount of change and then a lot of stuff can happen in the background. So there's a lot of mechanical advantage to being able to describe a whole cloud uh, set up in a single line of YAML, uh, but you do have to hope that you type it correctly, right? Because um, that feedback loop of making a change here and waiting for CI to propagate it out into cloud is very long, and now there's layers of abstraction which are hiding all kinds of information from you. Uh, so being able to edit test code is really fast, right? But changing configuration seems to be relatively slow and it seems kind of fraught, and so I'm kind of curious what's up with that. Um, so I've observed lots of configuration change related outages last year, particularly which kind of reaffirmed this belief I've had that configuration is kind of dangerous. Uh, and so we saw in um, the first half of last year, a lot of public clouds had big outages and not just clouds, but also vendors. Um, so here's a, just a bunch of postmortems are available publicly also at incidents reports, you might call them, uh, where configuration is being rolled out and an outage occurs. And sometimes we get to see that it's, um, well, what do we say? Uh, side effects of configuration changes. We didn't, we didn't expect things to happen. Um, sometimes DNS is the root cause, right? But DNS is, changing DNS is also a configuration of, of a sort. Uh, again, overloads is a result of side effects that we didn't expect. Um, and then sometimes it feels like there's just this lack of rigor. Like if only we'd done a little bit more testing before we deployed it um, to make sure the change had worked as expected. The, if we don't do that, sometimes the severity or the impact of an outage can be quite large. Uh, and there's a taste of things that we might look at a little bit later on where when is it configuration, when is it software? If we're compiling some script into another language like WASM, is that now configuration or is it now code? Is a program that describes how to do matching in say a web firewall a program? Or is it just configuration because it's describing how to do matching? So we, I guess that's a really tricky question because uh, how do we define this, um, this arbitrary distinction between these two things? If I have to recompile a program, and I know that that definition sucks because I don't have to recompile interpreted languages, but let's say that, that that's kind of my bar, that if I have to recompile something, then that's not configuration, right? That's definitely code. But if I can separate my code and my config, and distribute them separately, maybe that's how I can tell them apart, that uh, different release schedules and different speeds of deployment tells me how fast I can, like a configuration change I can do very quickly because there's not a lot of um, uh, machinery required to get it out into production, but a, a compile, a packaging up, shipping that out, maybe that's uh, something different. But I guess the most important thing about config is that there's this abstraction that allows us to uh, separate the details and hide a bunch of other details and a configuration, once it exists, is kind of hard to go away, but you can really add to it very easily once, once you've got that. Uh, and I, I realize that this is a terrible definition, but it's like a very a muddy area, a very gray area, and I, I'd kind of like to explore that as well. Um, but where do we get these configurations from? Where do they exist in practice? You know, you can see them as command line flags. You can see them as some um, files that are getting read, like a, a .ini file or something, et cetera. Uh, most programs read them, right? Most people, uh, most programs accept options. Some programs expect environment variables to change the way they behave. 
And if you start up a, a process that accepts communications on a port, like a daemon process or a server of some kind, then you can interact with it, right? And once you start interacting with it, maybe you can also tell it how you would like it to respond to the very next request. Like if I set an HTTP header saying, please set the cache control like blah, then I would like you to change your behavior based on that on a case-by-case -case request. Uh, so it starts to look a little bit complicated how we define this barrier between code and configuration because it seems like we can configure a whole lot of stuff all over the place. So here's some examples. Um, and I don't mean specifically environment variables as environment settings, but stuff that's outside of the program that we're passing into it. So parameters. We can pass in parameters through the environment variables in Unix. We can pass them in, as I said, by reading uh, files. We can say that uh, there are certain flags that cause behavioral change, and then some flags also have to be there for the program to operate at all. Um, so we might have, you know, this program can't possibly function without a database. So here's a flag that tells you how to find that database. And that's absolutely required for it to execute correctly. But then maybe we want to set the trace parameters, and you can totally operate without a trace parameter setting. You just don't do any tracing. Uh, but if you do set it, then we can set up tracing. Um, sometimes flags, uh, sorry, configuration parameters change the way in which the program responds to an action. So we can say that there are parts of the program which now don't execute based on whether we turn on a flag or not. Uh, and I'm going to use the word flag and configuration option uh, interchangeably because I'm not very good at standardizing on things. Um, so a configuration flag in this case is a way of creating two different programs. And it might seem either very obvious to you that that's the case or not obvious at all. Um, but it's kind of good to be explicit about this because I want you all to think about this this way. Uh, by creating a flag that either turns on or off different code paths, we now have two programs. And you know, there's a sim similarity here between running out of experiments and A-B testing and things like that. Um, calling things experiments or A-B tests can look a lot like configuration, but like, I don't really want to draw a strong distinction or, a, or a, um, equality between these things because I think for a thing to be called an experiment, I feel like there's some uh, rigor, you know, we set up a hypothesis, we do some testing, we get some results and stuff, and I feel like rolling out configuration is not necessarily that. So let's just say experiments are kind of a special case of, of configuration. Um, definitely they are configuration, but they're kind of not really what I'm talking about, so I spent already way too much time talking about them. Um, but there's another kind of configuration, which is not just a Boolean saying yes or no, do the thing. It's also like do the thing a certain amount. There's a threshold involved. Uh, let's say you set the number of connections that you can receive to a value, then the, comp the program suddenly changes its behavior based on the runtime condition of the program. So if there's more than 1,000 connections, or maybe you're in Craig's talk earlier where he's like, we have the, the number of max in flights unauthenticated SSH sessions we can have, and the program suddenly behaves totally differently based on how many there actually are at the moment. All right, so we depend on user behavior as well. So I guess totally, like my very general answer to what is configuration is its inputs to a program which sounds a little bit scary, I guess. Uh, but we've, we've ac extracted as many parameters as we can from the algorithm that the program's implementing and put them somewhere, and we pass them into the program at some point. And so there must be program inputs. And I told you I, I really like uh, computational theory, so I'm going to uh, show that I'm very bad at it. And we're going to go down some uh, very rudimentary th uh, computational theory mathematics. Um, if we describe our program with a function called p, and p takes inputs x and returns a y, um, you know, the, the p is the program, that's why you made it. We can uh, extract the parameters into a configuration called c, so now p is a program that takes two inputs. Um, our forgiven configuration in c, our program still takes x and returns y. Uh, and if your program happens to be an online service, then the users might not see p with cx returning y, they might see q of x, and then that's actually like the c, which is u, the sysadmin gets to program that part of the input. Um, you know, this is just currying, if you remember um, university maths. Sorry if you didn't do university, there's a thing called currying. Uh, Haskell loves it. Um, so we can change the behavior now without recompiling p. We still have the same p, uh, but we've given it a new c, c prime, and that's returning a new output, y prime, based on the same uh, x, right? Everyone still follow? Good. I see nodding of heads. Um, and this is not just theoretical, because going back to the earlier uh, 
examples, if we create a config that says enable feature is true, then we know that the uh, execution path is going to go through that um, feature method. So we have this implication that a certain bit of code was executed, and if we turn it off in the configuration, then the behavior of the program is different. Uh, there's a formal definition for a lot of this is like, but I have limited time, so I don't really want to bore you with the, the definition of that. Um, there's something else that looks like this. It's called an interpreter. Uh, they take inputs, program instructions, and they walk around them doing things, and then they branch around, and, and, but they execute parts of code, whether they uh, switch and go, hey, there's a knob, so I won't do anything, or maybe there's a jump instruction, so I'll change the program counter. Maybe there's things that actually do real bits of work, like adding things together. That, um, you can see how changing the input to this program changes the behavior. And I'm going to make the case that your program is very much like this one. Um, this is called the universal Turing machine, where there is a machine that takes the, all of the list of all the programs and knows how to decode those programs into actual programs and then execute them. Um, this is how compilers work. And you might go, hey, Jamie, this is kind of crazy. And I say to you, well, uh, consider the regular expression as a type of program because it's computable, right? Uh, we add constraints on our languages to make them easier to reason about, or we can increase the power of those languages and make them harder to reason about but have more, more flexibility. Uh, so a regular expression is not a very powerful program, but it's easy to understand, I think, unless you're using Pell-compatible regular expressions. Um, so, da here's another program. You need the right interpreter, obviously, but you can totally program in YAML. Um, so I want to be very specific about this. If you make a program that's not flexible, it's not a general purpose programming language, but it still does stuff based on the input you give it to, then by writing a program that, can, sorry, by writing a configuration, you are writing a program that configures that program. So that programs that program. So you can perform arbitrary comp computation within the domain of whatever your P is supposed to do, right? And this is all very fine in theory. Um, InfoSec have shown us in the last couple of years also that none of this is true. Like, we can make the programs do whatever they like, even if they weren't supposed to do them. Uh, OK, so the idea is that if you can prove that your program terminates under certain conditions, then it has certain properties. Like, it's a regular expression where you can say stuff like that. If we can't prove that it terminates, then we know it's like a Turing equivalent program. So we want to reduce, well, if it's possible to reduce the strength of a program to make it under, easy to understand, then it's still programming, right? Likewise. Your program is an interpreter. And all of that was trying to get to this point, right? It's not a very good one, and the language is kind of weird. But configuration is code, not just configuration as code, which people have been talking about for a long time, but configuration is, in fact, the same as code. Um, people have dismissed configuration as not really programming. Am I really programming in YAML? That sounds ridiculous. I'll flame you on Twitter. Uh, the IEEE Top Programming Languages report last year says that HTML is totally a programming language. And don't get bogged down in the details that people don't have conditionals or branching or loop instructions in HTML because that seems very elitist. And I agree with them. So don't let anyone tell you that you're not programming if you're writing HTML. Um, but it's also against the laws of programming to talk about any of this stuff and not mention the uh, Philip Greenspun's, um, what is it, 10th law, 10th rule. You get to this point, right? Your program now contains a poorly implemented version of Lisp. And so I've got to ask, why is Lisp a good choice? Why did GNU Scheme people for the last 30-ish years, or at least as long as I remember, being saying, hey, Scheme is a really good uh, configuration language. We should all use it. Um, so here's, here's an example, right? We can write a program that emits a tuple that says this is what the configuration should end up looking like. And this is a very trivial example. But we can imagine writing a, uh, some Lisp program that generates, like takes a whole bunch of other inputs, iterates over stuff, and generates a very complicated tuple that expresses a configuration. Uh, and it's quite possible now, because this is a computer programming language, that we can inject par parameters externally to this new program. Or you can inject code into it at runtime and call that as a callback, which sounds a little bit uh, terrifying. Um, but you, know, you can have very complex data types, including stuff that is executable code. Uh, so I've, then I asked, should it have been Lisp? And I went and found a study that was done inside Google, and it's kind of a, an active document. And at the point I read it, it said that there is a lot of DSLs inside of Google. There's the big four that everyone talks about. And then there's all of the other ones that people have written to try and solve the domain-specific languages. Um, many of these languages are Turing equivalent, and they're designed to emit protocol buffers. 
and some of them are executed within the address space of the program that receives them. Sometimes they're executed inside the CI pipeline to generate a static configuration that then gets shipped off and, and loaded up. Um, so there's all different ways of handling this, but there's, there's a lot of different ways of expressing intent in different programming languages. Uh, and this uh, fellow, Mike Hadlow, wrote about this many years ago, uh, 2012, according to his blog URL. Uh, so you start, this is called the configuration complexity clock, and you start with a hard-coded value in your program, and then you extract it to a flag, and then you go, wow, I really don't like flags, so I'm going to write a configuration file. Uh, and then you go, I'd actually like a rules engine where I can generate more um, uh, high-level intent for what I want. And then you realize the rules engine is no longer satisfactory. I'd like to have a full DSL. I need uh, conditionals and branches and so forth. Because um, it's very easy at that point then to add this stuff. And so you can see how this relates back to, uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce this as uh, Chomsky's language hierarchy. Uh, he says type three regular language is very uh, constrained and easy to understand. And type zero uh, recursively enumerable, uh, very difficult to understand in a general sense. Um, but if we increase the power of our languages and allow us to do more things, then we are moving up this hierarchy. And if we remove the ability to do things easily, constrain the languages more, then we're moving back inside. Uh, so this progression around Mike Hadlow's clock is increasing the, uh, the language power. Uh, but what I actually see in practice is not a, a clock, but a spiral of death, where we start with our thing and we end up with our DSL. And then what we do is we create a, another language on top of that. So uh, imagine you've got. Um, you don't, you, don't, you don't remove the DSL anymore. You've still got that on, on a lower layer, but you've got several systems that all need configuring, and there's some value that they need to share between these multiple systems. So what you do is you um, create a new program that writes that value at, say, we'll call it compile time. So it's, it generates it during CI and writes out the configuration files for both systems. And then you realize that that's uh, an adaptive value. So what we need is another program that reads something and then computes it and does it dynamically. And then you have a service that is emitting these configuration files uh, with on a five minutely basis, perhaps. Uh, and then you need to abstract on top of that. So you build another system on top of that, which program this system, and then a bunch of other systems that program these systems. Uh, and this is a common pattern inside of Google. And I've also noticed that it is uh, common outside of Google, because with Terraform, you can create um, thousands of nodes and then execute Puppet on all of those nodes. And Puppet is going to execute some more GS code that is going to go and edit uh, Senfail, Senmail configuration. And I realize that joke might go over your heads because nobody runs mail servers anymore. <laughs> so I mentioned before that configuration has two users. Or I'm not sure if I actually did, but note that it does. There's the person who writes the C and the person who writes the X. So there's the administrator, that's us, and then there's the user. And they have different roles. Um, so you can perform arbitrary computations within the scope of whatever your program P is supposed to do, right? Uh, so even though it's not true and complete, there's still possibly a large set of functionality it's capable of computing. Capable of computing. So I've got to ask now, what is the size of the input of this function? What is the domain of P, if you recall, um, I think year 10, year 9 mathematics? Um, or in a less mathematical way, how many different possible configurations do you have? And then in a re mathematical way, the number of options you have in your configuration is like the size of that set. And then how many different values could all of those different options have? And that is the Cartesian product of that set, which is just multiply out the total number of things by each other. So if you've got Booleans, there's two, right? Multiply it out by how many Booleans you have. If you have uh, Flags that take integers, right? How many values can an integer take? Multiply that out. If you have strings, then there's, it seems like an infinitely many bunch of them. I, I want to kind of get to the point that this is, seems like a very large number, number of knobs with a lot of different settings. So what's the number of permutations of knobs in the cockpit of the space shuttle? Does anyone know? Good, nobody knows. All right. So the idea behind this whole talk is that configuration is really hard. It's like code. Uh, it has large force modifiers. And empirically, it's the cause of many outages. So if I go looking, will I find that configuration is a key factor in the majority of late outages that are related to change? And will it correlate with higher severity outages? Um, so I went and looked at the research. And there's a, bunch of, there's a small number of bits of research about this. Uh, and a lot of them are kind of unsatisfactory because they rely on public results. And people are not really keen to share the reasons for the actual outage, and they write publicly digestible 
uh, incident rep reports. Uh, so this one, um, it says configuration is about fifth in the ranking. It says about 10% of root causes are related to con configuration. If you limit to only change related causes, then uh, configuration change is the third, but I only classified an outage if they use the explicit words they're looking for. Uh, and they only classified a singular root cause, which I feel like is not very um, uh, in line with best practice in the industry at this point in time. Then there's another one that Microsoft did, which is entirely based around the root cause of bugs that were introduced as software defects. So it has, uh, all the terminology is incorrect because they're actually measuring something uh, totally different. The SRE book said that 70% of outages are due to changes in the live system and then didn't go on to explain anything about what the breakdown between code and configuration is. Um, and like, that's it. The, the entire mention in the book is that. Is that. Uh, and then there was a blog post um, early last year which uh, classifies based on what the trigger was for a bunch of outages. How many did it do? A large number. It doesn't explain its methodology or the, the data. It didn't share the data set, but it came up with like five uh, observations of all these outages and said the change was about one third of them and config drift was about one fifth. Uh, so I like that the author did a lot of research but they didn't really share a lot of their, uh, their method. So it's tricky to uh, reproduce. Um, and then there's this other one from July 2019 which read 49 public outages and came up with you know, you can read the slide, it's uh, not very many attributed to misconfiguration. There's a bunch of to human error, which I'm like, oh, not really cool. Um, and then there's a publicly updated GitHub, which has a bunch of postmortems on it. There's about 200. Um, they're manually added to the end of the list, and then someone else goes and triages them and adds them somewhere else. Um, so uncategorized has a very large number, which is not super helpful. But configuration is ranked second behind that, which is, which is uh, kind of, um, I like that because that's what I'm looking for. And you know how uh, people are biased towards looking for the things they're expecting to find. Um, so I did my own research. I went to the SRE weekly um, newsletter, which is uh, you can subscribe online and it sends you an email every week. Um, so I tried to do a manual analysis. They, at the end of the newsletter, they have here are the outages that occurred this week, linked to a news article or a public incident report. So I went through and read all of them uh, until I got really bored because they're terrible. Um, so I ended up reading about 87 links. 46 of them were to a company status page. Uh, 41 to news articles. News articles are terrible, by the way, because they tend to say the service went down, people were angry on Twitter, here is a screenshot of Down Detector saying that it was in fact down. Uh, and so you don't actually get to understand why the outage occurred other than people were super unhappy that, say, Instagram wasn't working. Um, 62 of those 87 didn't give any description of anything that might even be interpreted as a cause or a trigger. Six of them said that a change or a deploy was the cause, and three said it was a configuration change. Um, six of them were nice to read because they actually told me like a whole story about what was going on. Uh, and I've got down here GCP number 187, um, Talkbox, Monzo, WhatsApp, and Heroku, and Reddit. So I like them. Uh, I also note that a bunch of the ones that I just named also did really terrible ones. So like, it's kind of hit and miss. Uh, I feel like the industry generally should get better somehow, but I don't actually know how we're going to manifest that. Um, anyway, so I was like, this is really disappointing, but I've also got one other data set available to me, which is uh, Google's internal postmortem database. And inside that database, everyone classifies the outages as they occur, roughly. Uh, so it's about um, several thousand of reports, multiple choice classification of causes and triggers, um, so it measures config pushes, binary pushes, both, oh, sorry, my research, I went and counted the ones that said there were config push triggered and caused, binary push triggered and caused, the ones that were both and the ones that were neither. Uh, and then I found that very disappointingly config and binary related pushes were about the same size and uh, config is only slightly higher than binary in a not especially statistically significant way in the big severity outage. And then year over year, thank you, uh, it got slightly higher up until um, 2018 in the pattern reverse, and I can't explain why, so it needs more investigation. Um, so the results are basically, I can't tell whether I was right or not. It seems like I'm still roughly right because I can't prove myself wrong, but on the other hand, unsatisfyingly, I can't really prove myself right either. So 
Now I've got a new question. Is Google an outlier or is this still indicative of the industry generally? Um, so I'm going, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. But I can go and see what we do. And so I want to tell you now some mitigations for the risk of configuration rollout. And the idea basically is going, well, configuration is code. So if you're treating your configuration differently than code, then you can't be doing it right. So let's learn what we did with code and then apply that to configuration. So uh, there's uh, another great paper, which was from OSDI 2014, that says that basically no one tests very well. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit if you just want to raise your early CI testing just that little bit. And the whole lot of low hanging fruit, it turns out there's lots of outages that could be saved if you just did that little bit extra of testing. Simple parse tests or validate that the configuration contains the, the uh, values you expect. Um, now, obviously, if you have a configuration file that is not true and complete, you need to write another program that reads in that config and test values. And this is actually really easy because if you've got a YAML file, you just read the YAML uh, and then say, oh, the uh, number of connections should be higher than the uh, value in the other service. You know, simple validations, test a whole bunch of stuff together. Um, but if you do have a true and complete language, then maybe you just throw some asserts. You go execute this program, and if it throws asserts, then it can't be valid. And this is great if you are actually uh, emitting values and testing things, and you go, uh, it should never be negative, so let's just make sure it never is negative, and then somebody can uh, program something that you know, does an int rollover, and all of a sudden things are broken. At least you caught that before it went out into production. Um, version control, and it might seem like a crazy idea, but if we're talking about configuration as code, one of the central theses of that idea is we'll put the configuration in version control and we'll do code review and we'll look at it and then roll it out through CI CD and all that kind of stuff, right? So code review and being able to review why things occurred is really good because it helps you resolve inc incidents faster. If you're committing into a database that has logs of reviews and a description of why it happened, then you can understand quicker why something happened. And Craig mentioned this earlier. It's like, you know, something really good is being able to write a comment when we change a value saying, the reason we changed this value is because uh, we noticed that the uh, performance of the service was uh, degraded or the capacity of the system, the user demand was much higher. So uh, being able to go back in time and say, oh, I now understand why people made that change means that um, you have more understanding, right? Um, I've also put running a command against an API endpoint because so many times people go, well, you know what, I'm just going to run my school admin, do the thing, and set the number of connections dynamically at runtime. Um, that's not great, I feel, because there's no uh, way of doing audits or um, change history on that. So if you have to run a command to, to make a change against an API, then write a script that runs that command and stick that in revision control. It seems very old school and uh, you know, not API. -y. You might not do it in like a fancy new language, but it's going to be much better than saying, oh, here's the script, deploy the uh, thing, and then also run these commands manually. And I find also for there's been some outages where someone goes, oh, I'm just going to run a th the test. Maybe I'll just delete these, uh, this setting, and it's totally safe to do because the system will protect me from itself, and it never does. And then all of a sudden there's an outage and trying to figure out why the outage has occurred because all of a sudden this particular setting, thank you, uh, doesn't exist anymore is really, really hard for people who are on call and the other debuggers because nobody has any idea that the command was run. OK, so I've got a minute, so I'm going to run really fast. Um, shift all the testing left. Um, help the administrators make good decisions about how they're changing configuration. If there's lots of configuration, it's really hard to understand. So uh, validate really early. Diff when things are generated against the version that's in revision control, so you can see what the uh, generated changes look like, because people want to know that the program that they wrote that emits config is also going to do the thing they expect it to. Uh, and config formatting is totally cool as well, because then you don't have to argue about um, alignment, but also if your YAML program changes its rendering, all of a sudden you understand why it's called a, a series of unfortunate indents. Um, Staging pre-production, you might be on the fence about this. Um, you want to make sure that the configuration rolling out doesn't break expectations. So you've got functional tests running against your staging environment. You're allowed to deploy stuff really fast there. Uh, it can't be equivalent to production, obviously. And you uh, might know Charity Majors, the monarch of monitoring, the queen bee of observability, says this is a terrible idea because exactly it can't be production, so don't have it at all. And I feel like I agree with her, but I also think that un unpopular techniques are come sometimes a stepping stone onto uh, higher levels of continuous improvement. 
Uh, property testing, so if you've got a big configuration, test all of it, right? Fuzz it, because you can't actually test all of it all the time, but you can kind of approximate that. Uh, they don't know how to test behavior and create logical tests, but they can make sure that you aren't crashing the system by making a, a, a rando change. Um, and this is kind of, <laughs> I really wish I had more time because this is the meat of it. Like the best single thing you can do to a system where you're rolling out new configuration that you can't possibly know what it's going to do in the general case is implement progressive rollouts. And that means uh, sandboxing a small amount of the production system where you deploy the changes to first and then gradually increase the radius of that configuration so more and more of the system get it. And that way you can tell very early on if the system's behavior starts uh, uh, behaving badly or uh, unpredictably uh, and affect a small set of your user base. Um, there's a, a complication which if you have a globally distributed system using the same configuration and it's sharing information between each other, uh, making inferences about what it thinks the other systems know, and then you roll out a new version of the config to one of them and all of a sudden it starts treating the other, the, the other nodes start treating it like it's gone crazy. And, uh, you see, you kind of need to understand that. Um, we had a system that uh, was negotiating traffic levels and uh, scaling uh, between things. And so if the algorithm changed, then the others would compensate for that, thinking that the system had gone offline. All we need to do is like share version numbers and stuff like that. I'm sorry. I'm almost done. Um, so yeah, we just added, added more messages so the other nodes could uh, cross-check themselves. Uh, and the last one is deleting code because the, the smaller the blast radius, uh, sorry, the configuration surface of your config, then the less you have to think about, the less comp complex it is. So it's collapse scaffolding, um, da da da. Change the power. Oh. If you can make your config language less powerful, you're good, I think, but also high level languages allow you to be more expressive and be less likely to make mistakes. So I don't really know what the uh, right answer here is. Both of them cause outages. Configuration code is treated so. Um, thank you. Here's a QR code, all the links I posted before, and a bunch of information. Thanks very much for your time. I hope you have a great conference. <laughs>